So there's a few words in German I'd like to share with you. Uh, how many of you speak German? <laughs> so like nobody really speaks it, but they're answering in German. That's good. Um, Kummerspec. Have you heard of this word? Kummerspec. Uh, it is the weight gain by eating when you're sad. Excessive weight gain when you're sad. And, and tr literally translated might mean grief bacon. Anybody eat grief bacon on a regular basis? <laughs> um, there's another one. Uh, Veltz Schmerz. Um, and this is the mental depression or apathy caused by comparison of the actual state of the world with an ideal state. So when you want something to be a certain way and it's not, and you have this Weltschmerz, you enjoy Kummerspeck, <laughs> right? Um, but the funny thing about these ideas is that in a, a language like German where you can just mash a bunch of words together, and we can do it too, kind of, but in their language, they can just smash a whole bunch of words together and just add the endings and, and beginnings and multiple, and it becomes a whole one idea that's amazing, and just right there in front of you. Um, and I, I think that uh, the idea of that connection is amazing. And I would say many of you, after hearing, hearing all of that, might feel a little bit meh. Do you remember that word? M-E-H, meh. Um, that, that's our great word that means, well, <laughs> I'm not feeling so hot. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, I'm not depressed, I'm not happy, somewhere in the middle, I don't know what to make of things, and it's just kind of, huh. And when you hear somebody say these words that you connect with and identify with, you go, oh, you too? I know that feeling. I've felt that. I've had that experience. Yes, I understand. And today, we're talking about God is one of us. And in, in many respects, this is that same idea. Uh, the big word is incarnation. That God has put on a body, come to humanity, and, and become a part of us so that we would go, oh, you too? You get it? And, and sometimes... I don't know about for you, but for me, it's kind of difficult to believe that Jesus really got it because he never sinned. Like he knew sin and the struggle of it, but he, he didn't sin. And so he didn't have some of the same ways that we have in some regard, like guilt. <laughs> you know, the afterglows of sin that cause us so much pain and anguish. But he also was fully aware of them because he could see them in everybody around him, Right? Um, so, as we look through this today, uh, I just want to encourage you to consider that God is one of us. He is aware of all the feelings, generically, that you've had, that all the ways that you've dealt with life. He's been there, seen that in some regard. Um, and this is in our sermon series, The Gift of Christmas, um, that's going on until just before Christmas, Christmas Eve. And it's the idea, again, to remember that Jesus has given us a great gift by becoming human and and letting us know him as he knows us. So let's pray together. God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for an opportunity to uh, spend time in your word and think your thoughts and be aware of what you have to say um, about this condition that we are in in this world. God, bless us that we might be a blessing to others. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. And on that note of God being one of us, the, one of the songs we sang this morning was Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Um, that God in Jesus has come to earth to be one of us. And this is something we should, we should celebrate because he's the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah. All those are same idea, just jammed into one from Greek and Hebrew and English, the anointed, the Christ, the Messiah, the, the one who tells us, I am here to be with you. Um, so John 1.14 is the, the thrust of all that. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And if we just spend a moment with this, the word, the logos, the identity of God, came to earth and showed us in human form that he is aware of our life. It'd be really hard for us to communicate with any being, whether it be an animal, an alien, <laughs> whatever, if we don't understand their life, right? If, if you look at ants and go, I know what you guys do, I get it, you're ants. 
It's kind of very distant and removed. But if we became an ant, and we understood life from their perspective, and they knew that we could see that, then that changes things, right? So, we have seen his glory. The people of that time really did see his glory. They, they were aware of who this was. And specifically, uh, John was one of those who watched him be transformed and saw him shining with light because he was in his natural form, you might say, the, the fully human God form where the, the blinders were taken away and he just shone that glory, that radiant beauty was there of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And the interesting thing is that he was full of grace, kindness, generosity, blessing, gifts, and truth, where he called people out and said, hey, that's sinful, no more, right? And, and it's those two coming together which help us to be more fully alive, more aware of this world and how we should live in it. So in Hebrews chapter 4, this connects us again back to the idea that Jesus does know us. Verses 14 through 16 say this, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. And what is our confession? That he is the Son of God. For we do not have a high priest incapable of sympathizing with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace whenever we need help. And we can go back to that time when he was 40 days in the wilderness. Now, we're only told of the three temptations that, that encompass all temptations, you might say. They are representatives. But I am sure the devil did not let him alone until one day at the very end. I would wager that the devil was there the entire time just messing with him because that's what the accuser does. And he just messed with him the entire time. And here's the other. How many of you have fasted? And not just for a medical test. I mean, like, you fasted for, like, three days or, or something of significance, maybe a week even. If you fasted for any length of time, you would think 40 days, he's dying of hunger. Well, yes and no. Here's the issue. When you fast, at the beginning, what happens? You lose your appetite, and you no longer feel hungry. You may think you're hungry, but you don't feel hunger. And especially as it goes longer and longer, you, you don't even desire to eat in some sense. You think, oh, it's breakfast, I should eat. But if you're busy with any other activity, you think, ah, I'm not hungry. Lunch, same thing. If you're busy, you forget about it. Dinner, you forget about it. And you think, I used to spend, in that fasting time, you think, I used to spend how many hours a day thinking about food? And now, Here's the other thing that happens. Your mind clears. A whole bunch of things in your mind, like um, chemicals that are maybe getting in the way of your processing of information and facts and feelings and everything, kind of move away. And there's a cloud that's removed from your brain. As you fast, clarity becomes a real thing. And you can think faster and better. And you have a heightened awareness of the world around you. And things change. And so here's Jesus 40 days later. Now, that is actually when, usually, you start to feel hunger again. Somewhere around day 40. And when you feel hunger, if you don't eat, it becomes problematic. You actually begin to die. And you need to eat, but you can't go out and eat a steak or a burger or even, a, even I mean, any real substantial food. You, you need to start eating, well, really drinking, boiled vegetables, and you drink the water from them. And then you work into solid food little by little as you break that fast. Because it's like your stomach isn't ready for food again. It's like you're a baby all over again. And, you know, babies, they come out going, well, just have some, some milk. But they don't actually drink milk, you know. The first process that happens is a cleansing fluid that kind of washes them out. And it's more like water. And then it moves into substantial milk, and then it adapts, right? Um, and so even... Us, when we have fasted for a long time, we need to break that fast slowly and gradually is the idea. And so the temptation to eat is overwhelming at the end, I'm sure. It is overwhelming because he's fully hungry at 40 days. And so you can imagine the average American generally hasn't felt that hunger. Jesus has. He knows real goodness Oh my goodness, hunger. On top of that, 
he knows all the other temptations because in the wilderness, Satan attacked him. And you can also imagine that as he's going through his ministry, so many people are attacking him in all the different directions possible. They aren't going to make it easy for him because they're trying to trap him, trick him, and kill him. And on top of that, you might think, well, he doesn't know betrayal. But then you think about Judas for a minute and you go, yes, he does. He knows all these things. He's experienced them. And you go, oh, but he didn't sin? Wow. So that, that is the positive side of grace. He was full of grace. And we, we can kind of get a little bit of grace, but I don't, I don't know that we're full of it the way Jesus was in the sense of without sin and then being blessed to forgive other sins. Like, that's pretty amazing. The next one that comes to us is uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. This is a song in the original language that they're pretty confident was pulled from the early worship setting. Um, and Jesus became like us. You should have the same attitude toward one another that Christ Jesus had. So the way we think about each other should be how Jesus thought about himself and thought about us. And it should be this, who, though he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be grasped. So he wasn't holding on to his godliness. Instead, he emptied himself by taking on the form of a slave, by looking like other men, and by sharing in human nature. So he came to earth and became just like us is the idea. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And there again, none of us have experienced that amount of physical pain. Like he knows pain. He gets it. And he humbled himself. He didn't have to do any of that. And yet he came. And his birth is what made it all possible. As a result, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. So here he is, humbling himself, serving at the point of death, and becomes the name that everybody worships. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the heaven, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So as we wrap up things, this is thinking about the idea of, of who God is and how he behaves and how he has blessed us and how he challenges us to think again. And I would say to go back and to think of Christ as fully human because he's fully human and fully God. And sometimes we don't give the fully human part the credit it deserves. We, we really might meditate more on how human he was and spend a little bit more effort and energy in that capacity that he suffered, not just in his death, but in his daily life. He understood cuts and scrapes and scratches and bruises and beatings and all of it. He gets it. At the same, he gets the emotional complexity of being alive and being human. I'm sure he ate some grief bacon occasionally. <laughs> right? And I'm sure he felt that odd state of, I made this world perfect, <laughs> but it's not. We're living in this mess. And then he ate some grief bacon, right? So faith challenges. Identify with the Messiah, with Christ, with Jesus. Identify with his humanity. Know that he understands. And second, identify with others. This is one of the most important parts of this. When people around you are suffering, struggling, or happy, it is so much more amazing of an experience, both negative and positive, in the sense that shared grief is like cut in half, right? When you share the grief and you go, yes, I understand. You're going through a hard time. I'm here for you. Talk with me. I, I can sympathize. I can empathize. I know what you're doing and how it's happening. I, I can see it. And then the, the other side is, when things are good and happy, man, so good for you, so happy for you, well done, good job, celebrate other people. Like, I think that is the identifying with others capacity. And also, the suffering that we experience in the sense of needing forgiveness, giving forgiveness, all of that, I think that's right there with it. And, and third, God will honor you. As you humble yourself, identifying with the humanity of Jesus, and humbling yourself, identifying with others and the things that they are struggling with, what will happen for you? People will call you friend. People will know 
that you love them, that you care for them, that you're with them, that you're for them, that you're right there on their side. Just like Jesus is right there with you on your side, saying, hey, come on, we can do this, right? And as that happens, then as you serve others, you will be honored. And you don't serve to be honored, right? I mean, at the same time, if you know the outcome, it's still in there, right? Nothing wrong with saying, I know the result. When I love others, I will be loved. Don't you want to be loved? (laughs) So then love others. This is the hardest, weirdest thing, though. Most people want other people to love them first. Most people want other people to forgive them first. Most people want other people to care about them first. Most people want other people to be more courageous so that then they can be courageous. But what if, what if we said, you know what? If somebody needs to go first, it'll be me. I'll be the one to forgive. I'll be the one to love. I'll be the one to sit with. I'll be the one to open my heart to others. So here's how I'd like to encourage you to, another faith challenge is not written down exactly, but you know, it's in there. Think of some people that you love. Make a list. Think of some people who have changed your life for the better. They have done something for you in a way that you went, I learned so much from that. I enjoyed that time so much. They were so kind to me. They were so, name it. They did this and they don't know how much that changed my life. And write them a letter. A real, honest to goodness, physical letter. And mail it to them. And if they're dead... Mail it to their child. Mail it to their brother, their sister. Find someone who you can share that with to honor them. To say thank you. In this, what are you doing? You're humbling yourself and you're saying, I know someone has treated me well. I know someone has done something for me that has moved me to be a better person. And now I'm going to take that and I'm going to spread that love, spread that kindness, and I'm going to tell others how much they have impacted me, how great it is to be in their presence, to be with them, how much I am thankful for them. I've had a few occasions to experience this, and and it wasn't in a letter, but it was in those moments of I felt meh. And a friend said, do you know how much I love you? Do you know how much we care about you? Do you know how much we wish other people would be like you and be our friend in this way? And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Thank you so much. And I've not yet, I mean, I reciprocated in that moment because I thought, yes, this is a great friend. I love this person. And then I told another friend and I said, you know, you're one of those friends too. And I told another one, you know, you're one of those friends too. But then I thought, you know what? I I heard about this guy, I think it was, I think it was Adam Grant. Uh, He's a, he's a, He's written a bunch of books, and he's a professor and all kinds of other stuff. But he said he took this challenge upon himself because he wished that someone else would write him a letter and telling him what he did. So he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send out. And I think he picked a big number, like 100. And he said, all I did for a week was write how much I was thankful for these people. And I just made a long list, and I wrote all these letters, and I sent them out. And it felt so wonderful. And he wasn't expecting it to feel wonderful for him. But in the end, he was blessed because he was blessing others. And I think, wouldn't that be amazing if we, as the church, lived in such a way that people around us went, I just want to be with you. You're amazing. You remind me of Jesus, maybe. So let's pray as Jesus has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Father, as we continue to pray, we do ask that you would help us to see again Jesus. His kindness, his compassion, his his life that is a love letter to us from you. God, let us write those same letters to the people around us that mean so much. God, bless us that we can be a blessing. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen.